Okay, so here with us are uh, Fabrizio and Marce, uh, who are going to tell us about their Python-driven uh, company. So please give a warm round of applause. Hello. So, hello, everyone. I'm Maciej, that's Fabrizio, and here's the rest of the team from TBG, uh, the company that we're representing today. So it's not our companies, we just work for them. <laughs> but <clears throat> So um, what the Pi driven company is about? So basically, um, we were challenged with quite a big problem at some point in our career while working at TBG, and the solution that we found was actually branded by us as a Python-driven company. So, um, before, oh, too loud, sorry. Okay, so before we actually start taking you through all of the uh, challenges that we have to meet, let me actually uh, tell you the story that we um, were fighting with. So, what was the challenge? So, we are quite a modest sized team, it's only five of us, three developers, it's here, and those three guys, and basically, Three developers, one QA and Scrum Master. Um, and then our management came to us and said, hey guys, by the way, so um, would you be able to provide some tools for the managing, management of data, producing report, uh, helping to uh, do the statistical inference and help all the bunch of our analysts that know actually nothing about programming. They, they actually would like to have shiny UIs. And there are quite a lot of them. There are some people from finance, actually they would need your help as well. There are people also even in HR, that would be nice if you could help them as well. So then we just looked at each other, just, just doing the simple counting, one, two, three, four, five, and then just realizing that it's actually a little bit too much for us. By the way, um, we started quite a lot of new features, uh, new, new actually projects, and we started to move to uh, the area that was uh, kind of unknown to the company. So when it comes to specs, so we had this incredible requirement, this point number two, and the second point was actually like, we really don't know what the specs are, so be prepared for everything, which is quite easy if you have five people. And please deliver frequently, naturally, and, and of course quality first. So when you deliver an application, that would be nice from management point of view to deliver the highest quality possible. So we started to scratch our heads and saying like, um, should we actually look for a job, and actually should we actually take that challenge? So. So now the big challenge. So we actually started to think about how we could approach that. And the first thing is actually we started to um, think about the basic foundation of working in, in, in a company because we realized that actually, so there is no way that we'll be capable of delivering rich UI application that will help automate some of the tasks of the people that uh, will actually make their life much easier because it's simply not enough of us and simply we don't have enough time and we won't be able to fulfill all the points that I just outlined a few seconds ago. So we ask ourselves, all right, so, so what's the current... <coughs> all right. So we ask ourselves, what's the current um, structure of a company? And then we realize that actually the structure of companies is even though we use all the agile, all the buzzwords of the Scrum inside the tech teams, we are pretty isolated units. So basically, if you think about it, you have a big guy in the middle and surrounded by small managers, and then of course you have a teams themselves. So basically, if you want to automate or make a life, automate some of the tasks of the guys that are doing the main work, that are doing actually the heavy lifting, we should go to them. So we shouldn't actually rely on the usual communication channels. We should actually think about the structure of a company like that. So the first. Uh, impression that you can have is actually, so this is like one big mess. So please imagine that each color represents people coming from the um, different departments, and of course, color in, uh, the size indicates uh, importance of a given uh, person in a, in a hierarchy of the company. So the tech team actually should be blended into the landscape of a company. So we thought, how about we actually go to people and talk with them and just ask them like, all right, what do you actually need right now? What's your problem? Like, we don't want to know like, what is like a high level specs of actually, you know, like a very advanced application that, that maybe in a few months, having the uh, team of this size, will be able of delivering. So then we started to ask even more questions to ourselves, to the others. 
in order to define our approach. So the first question is like, could we find a platform that would combine flexibility of Python awesomeness of the web tools? So why we actually decided to ask Python-oriented questions? Because the first thing we realized, no UI, all right? We, we went to our management to say, you wanna have those tools? Let's forget about the UIs, all right? No user interfaces, not, no graphical user interfaces. So they say like, all right, so how can you interact with, with, with the platforms, with the application? We say, you know, you can code. And it's like, whoa, but, but wait a second, like um, those people uh, know nothing about coding. So they're like, yeah, all right, so that's another challenge, we'll teach them. So, so basically, we just realized how about we use IPython notebook, where they can actually, you know, inside those really shiny cells, put some of the snippets, share those snippets, share the solution, automate their work, and we can, by being blended into the company, actually help them at the, um, every, every stage of the development. So actually we thought we will provide some high-level tools and they will provide more of them. So, so in other words, we'll go with the mashup kind of approach and suddenly our development team actually um, exploded to tens of people because it's not five of us anymore, but if they will gain even like a slight knowledge of Python, then they can actually build some apps for themselves. Um, some of the questions that they were asking and some of the struggling that they were having was mainly data oriented. So this is the world of Excel. So Microsoft Excel is like ruling the world of any analysis. And the biggest problem that they had with the big data, they were already calling it big data, is that they're not capable of opening the Excel files because they're just too big. So they already arrived to the world of big data. And we said like, all right, so the first solution that we delivered was called D3 analytical interface. So, so here is just very primitive and simple snippet, but actually this is all you need in order to fetch quite a lot, like around half a gigabyte of data. And of course, we don't, the user do, uh, do not have to know basically um, what we are using at the back end, whether it's Mongo, whether it's Postgres, so how we actually transform those data, how we actually deliver them. They don't need to know all the primitives. They just say like, all right, so I have this data store, which is like name of my client, let's say company A, and they say, fetch me data of that. And uh, of course they will fetch the data in the form of data frame, so it's already more of Excel uh, world. So, so basically we said, and when you have the data that you just um, fetched using three lines of code, you can either export them to Excel or, or perform your analysis in the notebook itself. <clears throat> so, and they, they actually interact with some of the services. And, and, and they ask us like, is it possible actually to automate those? So we deliver them a few solutions that enable them to just interact with the services, not only to fetch data and do the usual transformations, but actually to, to interact with the services, to post some of the service in the server-related uh, platforms, to actually fetch the results, to combine them and so on. And at the end, and, and of course, as, as always, <clears throat> we provided like a backend for storing um, the data. Okay, the, the biggest challenge that actually uh, Fabrizio will tell you about was actually to teach them that all. So we provided the high level um, uh, interfaces, the programming interfaces, so that they could just log into the software that we exposed to them for hosting their notebooks. They could actually just go there, but what to type? So in, a, so in order actually to achieve that, the first try was like maybe we will try this guy and, and being crazy enough to teach them Python programming, or maybe we need someone with superpowers, and that's Fabrice. <laughs> so, um, but that was totally not easy. So maybe the story that I'm telling you right now is like, it sounds trivial, and actually when I was presenting those slides, I thought like, oh, is it actually a good topic to present it during EuroPython? Because we are saying like, yeah, we, we just decided to teach um, programming to a bunch of non-programmers. But please remember that they have no association whatsoever with anything uh, programming related, like anything. So, all right. So the, the thing that we had to actually keep in mind all the time was whys and hows. So in other words, it's not only to show them the snippets and show like, hey, this would be super useful. You need to reinforce this idea that this would be actually useful and helpful all the time, every single small step. Like, hey, this is how you can automatically take all, get your, all of your data, do the analysis, and that's faster than, than any other solution that you know. Then, for instance, you can use this in this library to, to draw stuff, to actually plot some uh, things. Then you can use this and that to actually produce your reports. So 
by simply just introducing those those um, elements of their usual pipeline, we were able to reinforce those hows and whys at the same time. And the other problem was, and realized that we realized that we got it for free, is that the usual question that we are getting from them, can you say that in plain English? So in other words, like they were coming with some problem, they were like outlining the problem, like using their hand waving and, and just high level uh, terms. We were giving them response, the answer to that, and they were saying, oh, ooh, could you say that in plain English actually, because I didn't get that. So then we thought, oh, if we would teach them Python, Python is a language, we know it's programming language, but let's stick only to the language as a, as a buzzword. Let's use it, let's actually treat Python as a foreign language. So if you have a problem, draft your problem in the notebook and use the language that we really understand and then we'll deliver your solution much faster. And of course, dealing with the big data, as I already mentioned, let's use Python again. <clears throat> and if you combine their knowledge, if you actually introduce the multitasking of, of, of the Python that we are all aware of, they are just starting to just discover a totally different, different world. Okay, so naturally there were like lots of people being like incredible non-believers, quite lazy, didn't want to actually engage themselves into something new, and they were keep challenging us with some problems. So for instance, like, yeah, you know, there is this notebook, and they were using this special tone of voice while asking those questions. So, hey, can I pull my data using notebook? Yes, use request or whatever, like, is it possible to scrape websites? So. Of course, they were always waiting for this no, saying like, okay, our system have limitations. So, but they never ask actually the right question. So naturally, <laughs> is it possible to scrape website? Naturally, request, scrapey, whatever. Can I pivot my data? Pandas, can I create plots? Yeah, there is like a whole bunch of, of um, solutions for that. Can I work on millions of rows, which is till now like totally not possible. So, or you could actually use like you know the very nice solution of, of splitting your data into 10 Excel files and then trying to do big data, like MapReduce. And yes, Pandas again, okay, but I really need to work with Excel because like you need to have Excel, otherwise you won't be able to survive in the jungle of data. So read docs of Pandas, you know. <laughs> All right, what was the result? This is a work in progress, we are still struggling and fighting and trying to enforce our way of thinking. The result is far from utopian, um, but I think that lots of people actually learned something new. Lots of people started to automate their work. Lots of people started to actually gain uh, and, and do something um, in their free time, this time that we free it up by just introducing the solutions. And the main question was like, why did we do that? So. We have like very huge open space and I'm actually sitting there and, and observing people and we are like making jokes, like the tech team, we are quite happy guys. And then I am observing those analysts and the, the, the photo that I showed you of this crazy uh, Brazil fan. So basically this is kind of the faces they are doing when they are struggling with the big data or whatever. And, and you can clearly see that those people are not enjoying their day. So we thought like we need to give them something that will enable them to express themselves, some, some expressiveness. And the programming languages are, this is, are actually the tools of the sort. If I will give you any kind of problem, you will start to actually putting the keywords and the grammar of Python all together and give me the solution. They are the slaves of the UIs, which are actually just enslaving them and, and giving them no sort of expressiveness. It's about actually, you know, the scenarios, the clickability scenarios. That, that's what I actually achieving. With the expressiveness comes creativity. So I was thinking like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a software engineer. I don't, I don't know what kind of application you need. But if I will give you the expressiveness and, and free up some time of, of yours so that you can actually use your creativity with those new tools, you will come up with really awesome applications because you, you know what you need in your industry. And of course, at the end of the day, the most important is freedom. So I think that those people, the ones that actually leverage this knowledge started to be much, much more productive and, and hopefully happier. So let's welcome Fabrizio that will actually take you through the biggest challenge ever taken in the, in the UK, which is actually training non-programmers to program in Python.
So, hello, everyone. Um, so, basically, when we submitted the, the abstract, we were asked to, to have a separate section about the, the educational aspects of this journey that we had. So, these are my slides about it. Uh, you can find them here. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's open and public. And this is a little bit about me. I said a little bit. So, <laughs> don't have much time. So, why this part of the presentation? The short answer is that we, they asked us, and the short answer is we hope it's interesting. Basically, uh, some people teach Python, some people train other people in Python, some people have colleagues that they go, how, how do you do this, how do you do that? And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about a set of uh, guidelines that, that hopefully will inspire you in your, in your, uh, in your work, whatever you do. Uh, what we are going to talk about, uh, what a trainee should do, what a trainer should do, and basically about, uh, my experience in, in Manila. I've been in Manila two weeks in March to train 20 people. Uh, it was a very nice experience. I asked uh, to have four groups of five people uh, each, uh, po as, as much uh, differentiated as possible, because uh, I didn't want to have like one group of super smart people and one group of uh, less smart people. I want them. I wanted them to be able to help each other. Uh, so wait, wait, wait. These are the guys. These are my uh, my Manila. My Manila guys, and amazing people. Uh, so, uh, what a trainee should do? There's two things. Listen with a capital L, which means you have a trainer at your disposal, so squeeze him as much as you can. If you are ever going to take uh, training in anything, uh, get everything you can. Get the knowledge, the experience, what they think, why they think, uh, the way they think. How do they get the solution to the problems? Get, try to get everything from them. Use that opportunity and work hard, of course. Uh, what a trainer should do, uh, I think, he should have to achieve excellent in the following. First of all, smile and be patient, because if you, if you don't do that, you will put a wall uh, between yourself and the people you're trying to, to teach something to, and they won't be open. Uh, anymore, and you need them to be open if you if you want anything to pass to pass that to them. Never take anything for granted. So you can go and teach non-programmers uh, and start. Yeah, so we're gonna write a function and then a method, and then we're gonna use the class, and then we're gonna iterate over this stuff. And they go like, what? Because they absolutely have no idea what a function is, what a method is. So you have to give them the concepts, the lingo. All the words that we as coders use every day, and we, we are not uh, maybe even aware that this is a special language that, that we know and we use, but they don't know and they don't use. So the ideas, why do we need to do what we need to do, and the reasons, the reasons behind, behind uh, all the techniques that we use, uh, like code reuse, for example, why, why is important. Uh, use the GPS technique. This is, this is something that I always say. So. You're trying to bring someone from point A to point B through uh, a bunch of, uh, of roads, and at some point you can see by their faces that you, you've lost them. Uh, because there's some concept that they, they are missing, so they can't go from here to here. In this case, it's, it's you. You have to find another way to explain uh, to them. So ask what is not clear, choose different words, provide other examples, do not repeat uh, the same stuff in the same way because they're not going to go through that through that road. Uh, set some goals; they should be reachable. Uh, start gently so they they're not scared off at the beginning, and then gradually increase difficulty. And skip the boring, trivial stuff if possible, so they don't start wandering off cell phones and stuff. And deliver outstanding quality material. You have to put your be best effort in, into it uh, when you prepare the materials. Uh, for the first reason, you have to enjoy it as well. It needs to be uh, a pleasant experience for you as well. Uh, give them only what, what they need to know, because we're all pressed in time, especially uh, for me, it was the London people. 
Manila people, they're very open, they're very hardworking people. London people are a bit uh, more, more difficult because they have, uh, at least in our company, they have a lot of things to do. And so if they get the feeling that you are telling them something they don't need, uh, they get, they get. Uh, I'm not saying upset, but it's just, we, don't, we don't need this. We don't have time for this. So just give me what I need. So just give them what they need. Uh, focus, focus on their needs, which means if at some point you get, you get, to, you get to a point where you have to explain something, uh, again, uh, do that instead of trying to uh, stick to your, original, uh, to your original plan and refer to the real world, uh, something easy to relate to. So this is, this is just one example. When I, when I was explaining uh, how to handle files, uh, it's, it's all very, you, you can't just go and say, yes, uh, you have a handler to a file, a pointer here and there. Uh, you have to open it, do something with the file and close it. They, they won't remember it. So if you give them the example and you say like a file is like a fridge, they all know how to use a fridge. So you open the fridge, you put something in and you close the fridge. And they already know how to handle a file because they have the association with something they've been using since they were little kids. This is very important because they will not forget uh, that and adapt. So adapt speed, difficulty, and ha so have extra materials ready if you have a group uh, of people that are actually fast and know what you can cut if you have a group of people that are less fast. And entertain them, communicate your passion, uh, make them laugh and have a good time. Don't be too strict. If they make a mistake, use them, those mistakes um, to explain things again, instead of saying, oh, you made a mistake. Uh, and the next one is only for the brave. So if you have to take a slide with you uh, home today, just take this one, flush your ego down the toilet. <laughs> this is because you're doing it for them, not for you. And if you do it for them, it's just going to get so much better. Uh, the tools that I used, well, Ubuntu, uh, and then a Bash shell, IPython, console and notebook, uh, libraries, uh, Pandas, NumPy, and, uh, and the analytical interface that we, that we wrote. My paint with a, with a cheap uh, Wacom tablet that is, uh, that is really, really useful, because if I have to explain what a function is, I just go crazy to someone who is not a coder. But if you can draw a box with, a, with an arrow that goes in, with an arrow that goes out, and you see it's a, you know, a bunch of lines of code that take some input and produce some output, they all go, oh, OK. And uh, Skype or Google Hangouts when you have to, to, to go remote. And this is uh, an overview of what is it possible to deliver in about 12 hours. So we had an introduction section, uh, session, four Python, IPython uh, sessions, three data-oriented session, and one QA session at the end. So the introduction session is giving them all the points, all the concepts. Uh, so they have, to, they have to understand at least high level what's looping, branching, and so on and so forth. And it's really important because uh, it provides uh, content, context, so they don't get lost when you, when you then start to explain this stuff, the, ba the basics of, uh, of Python. So code reusing functions, the looping and branching, handling files, Python data structures, uh, the main data structures, and the main built-in functions. Uh, extra materials that I delivered, uh, so advanced stuff uh, with dictionaries, function arguments, list comprehension, slicing, and the broader introduction to built-ins. And the data-oriented sections, basically when you work with data, you have to do three things. You fetch data, you work with, with it, you clean it, you, you mangle it, and then you provide some sort of output that can be text, statistics, or uh, you know, those pretty graphs that everybody likes. Uh, and you have to use, of course, JSON because stuff that comes. We work, we work uh, with Twitter and Facebook, so we've got a lot of JSON to to work with. Uh, reg some regular expressions, some string manipulation, and of course the lovely daytime objects, especially with time zones, they are nice. So that's it. I hope this was uh, interesting for you. You feel free to contact us. And before before we close and open for question, I have a question. I have a favor to ask. Uh, to all of you, there's a, there's, a, there's a lady that I love to beat, and she's coming out of, uh, of surgery in this very moment. So if we, if we could have a, a round of applause to wish her good luck, uh, I would really appreciate that. So.
we have a few, a few minutes for, uh, for questions now. Uh, so please remember to use the, the microphones. Hi, thanks for the talk. So we are, I, I have a similar problem in my current company, but what would they ask for us normally are just queries, basically, just how many of these this month, how many of that. So maybe for us it would be even simpler. We could just somehow make it simple to make queries. Do uh, you have any suggestions how we can do that in a way that they don't allow, are not allowed to make some crazy queries that kill the database or delete all the records? Yes, this is exactly what we've done with, uh, with the D3 analytical interface. Basically, we provide an interface to them, and this, this interface limits their, uh, what, what they can do with the database. Basically, shields the database, and it has two, two basic uh, advantages. They can query the data regardless of where the data is stored or how the data is stored, and uh, and we don't have the problem of someone saying, oh, you know what, I deleted everything. So, because, because they can't, there's no delete everything through that interface. Um, how do you um, catch up with the questions which comes afterwards, after you leave Manila, for example? Oh uh, yeah, uh, basically, uh, I didn't, after I left from Manila, uh, some people uh, were still asking, how do you do this, how do you do that? And of course, I always make time. Uh, if my boss is happy, I, I do a remote session. If for, for any reason I'm very pressed, I do a bit of overtime, maybe an hour or so. And because I'm always happy to do this, I really, really love uh, teaching uh, Python or, or whatever. So it's, it's always a pleasure to help someone, especially when, when they are eager to learn. I just can't say no. So, so yeah. And, and there is also one more thing, because please remember that as soon as you introduce notebooks, this is the communication, actually, um, uh, item that is used. So whenever there is a bug or a problem, they just share a notebook with you. It's not high-level email sent to you like, hey, by the way, this is the problem. They just give you a notebook. You just run it and say, all oh, right, this is a bug. And it's very simple to actually, you know, that's why we said that, that Python would be used as a foreign language for us. Even though we are all foreigners using English, English is not enough to actually discuss their problems. We need to go into more formal one. Right. Hi, thanks of all. First of all, the, uh, thanks for the talk. You nearly answered my question. Could you have done it without IPython notebooks? I think that we actually were at the, um, you know, it was a perfect time to introduce kind of solution because I think that if we would introduce them like a console based, you know, uh, solution, which was like the bare bones Python, with, even without iPython, you know, like it's showing, uh, giving all the nice colors in the console, we will never actually be able to introduce uh, or, or even push this idea any further. iPython notebook gives this enough UI that you need you can plot things there, and this is mainly what they do. They want to get data, they want to actually perform some stuff on the data. The other thing was that they all mostly work on the uh, laptops. And the thing is that the uh, amount of data that are dealing with are just too big for the laptops to handle. So what we did, we just bought this super powerful server and just hosted the notebooks there. So since they are working in different time zones, basically they could have like 32 gigabytes of RAM or, 40, or 64 gigabytes of RAM just like that and just perform. And since they were not, you know, um, building the graphical representation of the Excel file, they could actually ha handle even more and more data with that. And then at the end, it was synced with their laptops. So, so when they were done, they could actually just save their, their um, results and even carry on on their laptops with much smaller, already cleaned up data or plots. Uh, you said that you were uh, using Ubuntu for the trainings. Uh, what did you do afterwards if some people were using Windows or some other operating systems? You said that you have a server with uh, notebooks. So do all the people use just that server or do they have local environments? So they were using their own computers with Windows, unfortunately, <laughs> but everybody uses Windows. And the, the place where we, where we host this technology is, um, is on, on Debian, right? Yep. 
So the notebooks are on Debian, and I use Ubuntu. So if you want to be a trainer, Ubuntu gives you all the tools that you need. You can do anything you want. Uh, and the beauty of, of the IPython notebook um, technology is that it's not really important what kind of uh, system you're using, because basically you do everything in the browser. So as long as you have Firefox or Chrome, and you don't use uh, the other one, <laughs> can't even pronounce it. <laughs> So yeah, if you if you are on uh, on Windows though, uh, there is a small problem when uploading stuff with Chrome. So if that happens, don't go crazy debugging. Just use Firefox, and it will work. Uh, yes, but how do you deal with uh, people that like want to install packages on their laptops or something like that? Like especially if you do data analysis, NumPy, and this stuff can get kind of hard. And explaining them like package managers and everything could be hard. So uh, do they just not do that and use the server, or do they actually want to use Python locally? Oh, uh, basically they didn't have to do anything on their on their laptops. Everything was provided on uh, on the server side. So where we host the notebooks, we have installed uh, all the libraries. So the three analytical interface, uh, NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, Pandas, everything they need is there installed for uh, ready to use. So they just open their notebooks. We have an authentication system for uh, for each analyst. And they go in and they do from blah, import blah, and, and it just works for them. So they have a slow, a slow window box or a super uh, nice Ubuntu machine. That doesn't really matter because the heavy lifting is all done uh, by us in the server that Machu was talking about before. Are there any more questions? So I understand that the data analysts are quite happy. You were also talking about the human resources people and the accounting department, yeah. um, which have quite different needs like um, payroll, yeah. <coughs> which was it handled also or did you? So, do so if you think about it, like one, one project that James developed for um, uh, finance team was basically, you know, they had this super annoying thing that they were doing manually, which was just combining Excel files that were delivered by the sales guys. And basically they had to build some reports on top of that. So it sounds trivial, but for them it's just a manual work. There is no other alternative. It's just wasted in wasted time during that, during, during which that person will go uh, irritated. And then just one of us, in this case, James, just provided a solution for them. So, so basically, we gave them the tools to, to talk with the data, to actually get the data, but at the same time, we're listening for some new stuff that we can actually deliver on top of that. So we're just basically delivering them like one magical black box you know, uh, function that they could actually call like a create report. And of course, under the hood, lots of stuff was were happening. But, but since we were free up from delivering QI, because nobody required that anymore. We could actually just focus on, on the business value, on the business um, uh, algorithm that was actually delivering the solution. So, yeah. Uh, sure. use of please, please use the microphones. <laughs> did the use of Excel or uh, several uh, such programs decrease after your training? <laughs> So, so basically, it, it didn't de decrease because uh, the thing is that they were not able, in some cases, to use it at all. Like, you know, ju just imagine um, they, they had this very nice um, adjustment mechanism. So they were opening an Excel file, and if the person was smoking, that person knew that it needs around 30 minutes to open that file. So that was a break time, basically. So they just stopped opening those. So maybe less breaks, maybe less bad, actually. I don't know. <laughs> but, but in Manila, actually, ch things changed a bit. They, yeah. They're starting to introduce IPython. They, they introduced the IPython notebook thing step by step in the process. So they were doing a bit, and then switching to Excel, and do the rest. And then another bit, and then switching to Excel, until it was all. I think the most important is that even if you train them, even if you show them all the solutions, you still need to wait for this discovery moment when they actually send you this email like, whoa, they actually realize that this is powerful stuff. You know, they were like thinking, all right, so, some keywords, something is flying around, but then they actually automated their pipeline, you know, and they actually realized that they can do something creative and actually contribute to something interesting rather than, you know, just, just clicking through their life. Yeah. Okay.
Thank you very much, Maciej and Fabrizio.